Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome back. So we, we begin with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come before your presence in the name of your Son, Jesus. During this Lenten season, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds always, to discern your will in our lives and live according to your will. We pray in a special way for your inspiration during uh, these courses as we delve into the bioethical issues in human life and in care for the environment. We know, Lord, that these are complex, delicate issues, but with your inspiration, we're able to see clearly what is the solution to the issues at hand. We know that uh, you inspire us, that you guide us, and you seek to uh, give us the grace necessary to come to the right decisions and the right conclusions. We pray in a special way during this time for all those who are in most need of your divine mercy. In the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So once again, this is the, for the sake of the recording here, the Master of Science in Bioethics at St. Thomas University the course on bioethical issues at the end of human life. And today we're going to look at the determination of death and also ordinary and extraordinary means of life support. Okay. Yes. I, forgot, I do have a question about yep. the previous lecture, but yep. we can do it at the end. Okay, sure. Okay, unless you find some relationship as we go along, if there's some something that ties in with the topic, okay. feel free to ask it. Okay, so uh, we had uh, switched the, the topics a little bit. Did euthanasia before covering this. Actually, I would uh, have preferred to do the determination of death and ordinary and extraordinary means of life support before looking at euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide, but because of the, the, national, the American Nurses Association uh, period of comment for shifting to uh, participating in assisted suicide, then uh, I reversed the order of the lectures, okay? But as I was looking at the order of the lectures, also I noticed that we're able to do these two lectures today, and then we'll only have one more lecture, which is going to be on nutrition and hydration, and the case of Terry Schiavo, which was a very delicate one. So while I'm on lectures and schedules, I want to point out that next Saturday is Holy Saturday within Holy Week, and we're not having class next Saturday, okay? Uh, but then the following Saturday, we'll have the last class of this, course, last class of this course, and that's going to be April 27. And that will be the class on nutrition and hydration. And we'll look at the case of uh, Terry Schiavo. Technically, we would still have one more week, which is May 4th. May 4th. Mm. However, it uh, happens to be ordinations at the cathedral uh, every, it's always the second Saturday of May. Uh, so I'd like to uh, go to that and it's in the morning, it's mid morning. So we're not gonna have class. But the second Saturday is the evening class. Okay, the evening class. Sorry, yes, you're right. Oh, yes. Right, okay, thank you, yes, exactly. It's uh, May 11th is um, the ordinations, and it would be the first class of our environmental course. So what I'd like to do is switch. I would like, since uh, we've run out of the topics for this course on uh, April 27, we actually have May 4 uh, free. So I would like to start the environmental course early <laughs> on the 4th, all right? before the actual schedule starts on the calendar, on the official calendar of the university, but who cares? Mm -hmm. no, the important thing is to cover the material. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So May 4th, we'll start the environmental bioethics course, okay? And then May 11th, we're off, no class. And then we'll continue, oh, May 18th also, we're off on the schedule because I have a, a present retreat. So the next meeting after that will be May 25th. And May 25th will be our second lecture on the environmental course. Second of a total of uh, seven or eight. So it's a short uh, summer. Okay. Father, I have a question. And when yes. do we have to do the registration? Uh, already. Um, already you can uh, do the registration. I have a question about that because yep. I've never done it. I've always just been registered. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. I think you did it last time. So actually what happened is with, uh, with the registrar's office, because this group moves as a cohort, then the courses are fixed. There's no option. There's always two courses and um, they're fixed for each semester. So registrar has doing that, has put you on an automatic, automatic registration. Oh. But uh, just check, make sure that you do appear for the summer registration, okay? <laughs> yeah, but uh, she's been doing that automatically because it's a set cohort that moves straight through and there are no course options. There are no other courses for you to choose instead of the ones that we're offering but every the, semester. The course is the environmental. And yeah, but it's also the statistic, the biostatistic course, okay, okay which will be one week evening. I don't know if, uh, <clears throat> well, since we're on this topic, let's go there for a moment. Today's not, it's not gonna take the full three hours anyway. So let's go there for a moment, just to look at the summer, where it's scheduled, what week evening. <coughs> so you know how to get to the Bobcat, right? Yes. And then in the Bobcat, to get to the schedule, One has to log in first. I don't know why, but that's what happens. Okay, over here, under students on the left hand side, you can search for registration and search for sections. Just a lot of clicking. Then the term. Okay, so summer term one. With the, with the environmental bioethics. Uh, no, it's not this one. That's another course that I'm teaching in summer. Let's put it full summer. And let's also look for the math, for the stat. Okay, statistics, this should show the, the two courses. Okay, so here is the human population bioethics course, online and classroom, meaning that it's blended. Okay, and then here is a statistics course. I think it's this one, apply statistics. No, this is in the morning. Tuesday, Thursday in the morning. Hmm. Okay, what I see is that the applied statistics may not be posted yet unless it's posted on summer one. Let's take a look. No, it's not on summer one. Okay, it looks like uh, the professor has not posted the statistics course yet. That's probably why you're not seeing it. Have you gotten a registration already for the summer? No. No. I no. received an email that 
like speak to your counselor, yeah, counselor yeah, or advisor. Yeah, yeah. That right. That yeah, that's kind of an automatic thing. They send that a month before the semester starts, more or less. Okay, the professor has not posted the stat course. Uh, that be, should be showing up momentarily. So I think it's better to wait until the class is there, right? Make sure that yes. we register for that one. Right, right, for that one, yes. The other one you can register already, the, the environmental, if you haven't uh, registered yet, the environmental one, okay, environmental bioethics. Okay, so back to today's lecture then. <clears throat> We're going to look at, uh, within the context of the determination of death, we're going to look at uh, the, something called the Uniform Determination of Death Act, right? It's an act, in other words, it's a law, but it was done at the state level, <clears throat> and I'll explain what that means uh, in a minute. The acronym is UDA for short, or UDA, UDA. Also, of course, for us, we look at dying within the context of faith. Then we're going to look at ordinary and extraordinary means of life support, the distinction between the two, and also the distinction between assisting or substituting vital organs, which is going to help us make this bioethical distinction between ordinary and extraordinary means of life support. Three examples dialysis, the vent, and CPR, which we've touched upon before. And finally, the bottom line on today's lecture is that crucial distinction between killing or allowing to die. Again, this is going to sound today's lecture a little bit like deja vu because we had to cover some of this uh, for euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide already. Okay. All right, so let's move forward. Did anyone hear about this Uniform Determination of Death Act? No, never heard of it in the 1980s? All right. Surprisingly, before the 1980s, there was no uniform determination of death in the United States. Each state had its own determination of death. And some states didn't even have a determination of death, officially speaking. All right, and so there was no uniformity, which meant that really, literally, one could be dead in one state and alive in another state, <laughs> because there was no uniformity on the declaration of death. Now you can see that the declaration of death has uh, impact at many different levels. For example, obviously, the first impact is at the medical or clinical level, because we don't intervene on cadavers, right? And so that has a, immediately a, a medical or clinical uh, implication, whether the person is dead or alive. It also has legal implications, and it has uh, fiscal implications with regards to inheritance and bank accounts and property and all that. Mm -hmm. It has uh, social and family and personal implications, right? Uh, if the person is alive, we don't want to bury them. But if they're dead, we do want to bury them. <laughs> so you can see that <clears throat> the determination of death is really a very, very crucial, important thing to have at the social level. And also for it to be uniform, meaning that it is pretty much the same standard across the 50 states in the United States and in every other country, we hope that uh, they have something similar, okay? But really before the 1980s, there was no uniformity. And so there is a group in the United States, a, com it's a commission, a conference or, yeah? It's a group, it's called the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws. And what these commissioners do, their commission is to look at laws that apply to all states or events that apply to all states and where there is no uniformity. Uh, for example, traffic laws. Again, 
obvious things like driving on the left or driving on the, on the right side of the street, right? You want those things to be uniform. Uh, that red light, the red traffic light means stop. There's no reason, there's no intrinsic reason why red should make us stop, right? It doesn't hit on the brakes directly on the car or anything like that. It's a convention, it's what we call a convention. And it behooves us for the red traffic light to mean stop in every single state of the union. Otherwise, we're gonna have traffic problems. <laughs> so things that are kind of obvious, but uh, when we start looking and comparing between different states, they, there are many things that are not necessarily uniform across the states. Um, and this one was one of them, the determination of death. So these commissioners, these folks uh, got together and started looking at a determination of death, which was really a major task because of all the implications that are involved, very significant uh, contribution. And they associated, or well, they brought on board uh, three other groups that are, again, very influential, and they're stakeholders. They have something relevant to say with regards to the death of a human being in the United States. One is the American Medical Association, the AMA, all right? I mean, we have to understand not every doctor has to belong to the AMA in order to practice medicine, but it is a very prestigious organization and it holds a lot of clout. And in their annual convention, when they come up with uh, policies, that policy has an impact and has the capacity to influence legal policy also at the federal level and at the state level. They even have a very uh, strong lobby group in, Tallah in Tallahassee and in, well, more in uh, DC, Washington DC, uh, to have an influence on how medicine is practiced in the United States. Okay. The American Bar Association, ABA, is a little different because my understanding is for lawyer to practice law in a particular state, they need to belong to the ABA. They need to pass the bar or at least the bar exam. And it's the ABA that puts that bar exam together. So anyway, the American Bar Association is for lawyers, is the legal uh, equivalent, if you will, of the AMA. And certainly they have uh, something definite, uh, they're stakeholders in the determination of death, right, of human death. And then something from the White House, in other words, the executive branch at the federal level, right? Executive branch of the federal level. The President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine and Biomedical and Behavioral Research. I don't really know what the acronym for this is, but this is a commission that each president puts together, all right, to help the president decide on these ethical issues in medicine and, uh, and scientific research, biomedical research, in other words, human subject research, right? Okay, and you can predictably, that commission is going to change and shift uh, from administration to administration, depending on who's on, who's on the White House. <laughs> if it's a Republican or a Democrat, that commission composition is going to change typically more liberal or more conservative, depending on what party is uh, on the White House, okay. At any rate, uh, these three other groups assisted the Conference of Commissioners to craft a uniform determination of death act. You know that an act is a proposed law that comes out of the legislative branch of government, whether it's at state, or at federal level, right? At the state level, it's called the state legislature. At the federal level, it's called Congress. And most state legislatures follow the same format or the same uh, breakdown as uh, Congress, which is two chambers, a House of Representatives and a Senate. So in the state of Florida, also we have state representatives and we have senators for the state, just like we have a Supreme Court of the state of Florida. And we also have a Florida constitution, but they have somewhat different character 
you know, the U.S. Constitution should be basically written in stone in that it should not be changed unless there is an amendment to the Constitution, which takes, uh, I believe it takes a Constitutional Congress to, to change, to amend the Constitution of the United States. So you want that document to be very fixed, all right? And that's why you have the judicial branch, uh, essentially the Supreme Court, which interprets the U.S. Constitution at the federal level. In contrast to that, a state constitution should be a live document that should adapt uh, to what is happening in the state because, <clears throat> and that points also that the United States is a United States of America. So the, pri the, the primary authority should reside at the state level. And only when things cannot be resolved at the state level should they be bumped up to the federal level, right? And so the states, each individual state should have the preponderance of the authority, the power to legislate and so forth and to enact laws that are beneficial for that state as long as they don't interfere with laws of other states, you see? So having said that, <clears throat> A state constitution should be a dynamic document that should be updated periodically. For example, in the state of Florida, well, first it was a Florida purchase. Uh, Florida as a peninsula belonged to Cuba <laughs> uh, when it was still under Spanish uh, colonial times. And it was purchased by the United States to be incorporated into the United States as a state. But even though geographically it's attached to the United States or the North American continent, politically it used to belong to Cuba, all right? So it had to be purchased. Also, Louisiana, I believe, had to be purchased from France, the Louisiana Purchase, mm -hmm. all right? And so you see that uh, these things have a, a history of their own. And Florida has uh, grown very fast. Florida used to be first a wilderness state pioneer and people were selling properties here, all this, the scams that were done just about 100 to 150 years ago, people selling land in the middle of the Everglades and then the people would come from, from up north down here, the snowbirds to purchase and to, to see the property that they had purchased, this beautiful property in sunny South Florida. And it was in the middle of what they call the swamp earlier. And it was a big scam that happened you know, at the end of uh, the turn of the uh, last century, late 1800s, beginning of 1900s. Um, at any rate, those who bought closer to uh, the bay actually bought large tracts of land and eventually made millions out of it by urbanization and development. <laughs> but Florida went basically in three stages to a wilderness state, to an agricultural state, but the agriculture was more down the central part of the peninsula around Lake Okeechobee where one had access to fresh water, but not into the swamp of what is the Everglades today. And the coast were fairly uninhabited. And then uh, little by little, the coast, both coasts, first the East Coast and then the West Coast, started urbanizing and grew very rapidly, exponentially. First, the first big wave was the uh, uh, Cuban migration in the 1960s and then other waves of migrants, uh, plus people from the North. So now we have a very urban state. And even though it's a toss up between agriculture and tourists, the two big industries of the state of Florida. But you can see that those are significant changes, uh, sociologically speaking. And so the constitution of Florida should be updated periodically to reflect those changes and those dynamics, all right? We're becoming a very fast growing state. Central Florida, which was very laid back, uh, rural, has become huge, urbanized. There is the I-4 corridor between Orlando and Tampa that is becoming a high-tech corridor, you know, competing with the uh, research triangles of California and uh, the Carolinas and so forth. So anyway, all this to say that states, just like Florida, change sometimes rapidly. And so their constitutions should adapt to those changes also for the good of the people, of course. Anyway, that's a little aside.
<coughs> back to Uda or Yuda, uh, eventually this commission came up with the Uniform Determination of Death Act, which was proposed as a model law in the 80s, and it had to go state to state because, again, not at the federal level, but each state has the right to determine who is alive and who is dead in their state, <laughs> okay? What the federal government does only is they tabulate the number of deaths, and that, that's in the uh, uh, Bureau of Vital Statistics you know, at the federal level. The Bureau of Vital Statistics, they keep a track on who's born and who's dying, who's dying or who's dead in the United States. That's just for vital statistics. Mm -hmm. But it's at the state level, the determination of death is done at the state level. So, thanks be to God, they came up with a uh, two uh, criteria, which can be either one, can be either one. The irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions, translating that into plain English is no heartbeat, and no breathing, right? Or no pulse and no breathing. Or the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. And so the first one is called the classical or the traditional definition of death. Classical or traditional definition of death. And the second one is known as the neurological uh, criterion of death or definition of death. Neurological. Neurological, right. Because it's about brain death. Okay. So looking at these two for a moment, the standard or classical criteria is no heartbeat and no breathing. It's also known as the cardiopulmonary criterion, right? Because those are the two main organs that have failed irreversibly. The heart has stopped and the lungs have stopped. And what's your intuition? Do you think that any instruments are necessary to detect those? <laughs> the monitor, you can do the stethoscope if you want, but as far as the law is concerned, as far as I know, strictly speaking, no instrument is necessary. Of course, a good doctor, a good nurse is going to use the stethoscope, right? If that's the only thing that they use it for, <laughs> because I think the stethoscope is now becoming a, it fix you in the mirror. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Look and listen, right? So. Sometimes when they die, they be there, and you can kind of tell. And I feel bad. I just keep praying because I'm like, where is that person? Because I have not my medical Right. Like, you know? Yeah. You can yeah, tell. You, you can tell. Yeah. Can there see. are times where they start the movements. They can start, you know, exhaling and stuff like that. So it's kind of weird because, like, yes. you can tell, but then they start doing the movements. So, how do you explain that to the family? I don't know. It's very. Yeah. How a cadaver exhales yeah, the last breath, but they're actually dead. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a collapse, no? That happens. But it takes a little bit to happen. There are some little, like, there have been times where I have been with a patient and I can tell that they have passed away. Yes. But the family is here and they go, they like move and this and that. And right. Like, they didn't move, they, they did not move. Gone. And I'm like, nurse, mm. yes. nurse, yes, <laughs> like, exactly. And I'm like, give me one second. I'll just step mm. outside because like, I can't say, first of all. Exactly, you can. Secondly, like, really, I mean, sometimes they have really low breathing where they look like they are and right. they're actually not. Right, right. Very shallow, very, very shallow breathing. Say, I cannot say. There was one case where, like, I knew for certain, and mm. there was no movement in that moment. There's other times where you really can't tell the difference between when they had the very, very shallow breath mm -hmm. to when they actually just stopped breathing. Yeah. And sometimes it's also, from my experience, and I don't know 
it maybe it's because of, of the drugs or something mm. because of morphine i don't know mm -hmm. but sometimes it's such a shallow breath that, like mm. even the nurses are watching to see like are they gone or not and then they're actually still alive mm -hmm. so it's a weird so they wait weird yeah. process weird transition right. but i don't know if that's maybe the drug that yeah Yes, it know. could be. It could be. No. That happens often. That it's so so shallow that it just. They're just lingering, lingering, huh? It's just slowly, like it's like a very fade, like, like a real. You know, fading away. Exactly, like very. I've had a few, but most personally are the worst yeah. because it's right. hard to tell, and the family's constantly like, are you mm -hmm. And you see that process rather when mm. they're in the process of dying. Yes. When there's another process that is sudden death. Mm -hmm. yes. So they just yes. collapse and everything right. stops and pops. Right. And yes. You're, you're talking about more of the hospice population where there is a dying process. Exactly. Yes. yes. So how those ones are the hardest. You know? Yes, so, it does. And it takes time. And sometimes they kind of linger and they're kind of holding on, right? Maybe they're waiting for another relative to come in or something who knows what they say that maybe uh, sometimes this happens someone who was far away and they finally show up and then the person finally lets go so there are all kinds of possibilities uh, what i've heard is at least for the pulse so the heartbeat itself there are two options to try to feel for a pulse not only on the wrist but you can also try some other pulses on the neck for the juggler and so forth uh, but um then also for breathing, sometimes I've heard a mirror, a little mirror yeah. right up to the nose to see if it fogs or not, right? Because if it fogs, then that's exhale of water vapor that we have in the lungs that we, that we get. We exhale a water vapor. And there's supposed to be a nurse that's committed to, to time of death. Is that right? Yes. My great uncle mm -hmm. in the hospital, the nurse was pretty scared to say, even though it's pretty obvious. Yes. And when I, when I got there, it was obvious. Obviously, like for mm. like two hours. Mm. I had I had left, and then she came back. Um, my great aunt for things, she said they haven't even officially come in to come. Like, what do you think? Like, right, and it had been about two hours already. Huh? The nurse got scared. She said oh. that like she left, and she said that the oh. doctor was coming, and no doctor ever came. And when I got there, oh. obviously I was in my hospice attire, and I was oh. like, uh. What's going on? And exactly. They, and that doesn't stop me. Really? Yes. And the nurse at the station was like, I'm so sorry. They said she came yeah. and signed the papers with you. Like, so she said, officially reported that he was gone. Right. They couldn't yeah. say it. Yeah. So I wasn't sure that it was true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it gets delicate, right? It gets delicate. Right. You had a question? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I went to the convention this past weekend at Orlando. Oh yes. And okay. the image of brain in ultrasound, mm -hmm. they, they call it transcranial Doppler Doppler. A Doppler, yeah. They um assess the circle of Willis. Mm -hmm. And um to be um a hemorrhage, if you have a brain hemorrhage, is that considered brain death or not? No. No, not necessarily. And we're going to talk about that. That's going to come into the neurological criteria. Okay. okay. So Anyway, the, the standard or the classical definition has been around for <laughs> decades, centuries, okay, millennia, that was the standard way. But now, this other criterion has been uh, accepted, which is the neurological criteria. And thanks be to God, it's not partial brain death precisely. It's not just the brain as such, the cerebrum, what is uh, depicted here in uh, pink or like violet, right? Not just the cerebrum and the cerebellum, but also the brain stem. Very important. The brain stem, also known as the medulla oblongata, okay? Including the brain stem. So the neurological criterion, which is brain death, is not partial brain death, not acceptable, but is total brain death. And total brain death means that it includes the brain stem, which technically speaking is, you know, it's part organically, it's part of the, uh, of the spinal cord. But functionally, it runs the involuntary nervous system, which includes heartbeat and breathing. <laughs> Okay, respiration and circulation are controlled here. 
And that's why when we are unconscious, as in a coma or a vegetative state, state or a sleep, right, last night, the, cere the cerebrum was not uh, conscious, but the brainstem was definitely active in keeping us alive overnight. Mm -hmm. And so very important that uh, these people consulted with AMA and the AMA did not give in to the temptation of using partial brain death because that temptation comes in with what? With transplants, with viral oh, organ yeah. transplants. And that's what's happened. You see, back in the, even in the 80s and the 70s and further back, uh, transplants were very risky and generally unsuccessful or the, the patient would only last for a few months or a few years. Uh, but since then, transplantation medicine has uh, come of age as it were, and has become very, very good with uh, positive prognosis, very, uh, very good prognosis of a long life for transplant patients in different organs, whether it's live or cadaveric, all right? And so the temptation is to declare a person partially brain dead, but the uh, stem, the brain stem is still active, maintaining the heartbeat and maintaining respiration, maintaining circulation, which means that the vital organs continue to be irrigated. And a case like that could be a person in vegetative state. <laughs> where we saw from the MRIs that I showed you, the, the brain was uh, non-functioning, the cerebrum, but the stem was certainly functioning, okay? So that was a close call in the 80s. Uh, thanks to God that uh, they opted for total brain death, and this has been adopted now by all 50 states as uh, the Uniform Determination of Death Act. All right, had to go through legislature in each state and so forth. And these two criteria are operative. So that answers the issue of the circulation. And if there's a hemorrhage, even a massive hemorrhage, that could affect the brain, but not the stem. So we have to see if the stem is still functioning. And that's why an EEG is typically indicated for the neurological criterion. And in fact, they tend to do two, <laughs> maybe half, uh, several hours later, they will do a second EEG. And in some sta states, it takes two. If they're going to use a neurological criteria, it will take two neurologists or two doctors to uh, sign off, to certify on the brain death, okay? Just to make sure. Okay, so we're clear on these two criteria. Either or is fine. Uh, brain death typically is a traumatic blow to the head, but it leaves the organs more or less intact from the neck down. And so these cadavers are uh, good candidates for organ transplant, for organ transplant, especially the heart. And sadly, the typical brain death donor is a motorcycle rider, right? <laughs> Yeah, because it's their body against the pavement, their head against uh, a hard surface like a, the asphalt, the concrete, or the car. So <clears throat> that's what happens there. All right, let's move uh, forward a little bit. Obviously, we put uh, dying within the context of faith for us, and the fact that uh, I talked about this already, I think. Uh, that uh, human life is a fundamental value, but not an absolute value, right? At some point we are going to die. And so we have to uh, be able to let go. Mm -hmm. But we need to preserve life while there is a life there. So that's where cure and care comes in, right? Where there's no more cure, care always obligates. We're gonna pick up on that discourse with nutrition and hydration uh, next class uh, in two weeks. Okay, so 
just to have as a guidepost hmm? what is the life expectancy in the United States? You see, we have to go state by we have to go country by country. And even within the country, <laughs> medical care is not necessarily uniform, right? Like it's expected and in large urban areas there may be better access to more specialized medical care as opposed to rural areas and so forth. And, but certainly between different countries, there would be different standards of care. What may, ordinary, what may be ordinary in one country may be extraordinary in another country, depending on resources and many other um, factors. So in the United States, the life expectancy is uh, around 79 years old, more or less, but that's combined. So the combined doesn't really tell us much because we're not combined for either men or women, okay? Uh, so for women, it's 81 years of age, average, and for men, 76. Uh, the number one killer for men is still heart attack. I don't know, for women, maybe cancer or senility, I'm not sure. But you can see that more or less it hovers around 80 years of age. And it seems like that's pretty much the, the average longevity of our vital organs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm always uh, struck by these numbers because there's a passage in the Old Testament that says uh, something like this, paraphrasing, what is the life of, of man? Uh, 70 years or 80 for those who are strong, it says there in the Old Testament, which we're talking about centuries or maybe a thousand years before the time of Christ. So for 3,000 years, you know, we're about the same <laughs> uh, life expectancy. So it could be that this is just the average lifespan of our organs. Every species has an average lifespan in nature without any medical intervention. So us humans that have the practice of medicine uh, available, and we're still hovering about the same age anyway. <laughs> so uh, that is because of many, many complex factors. Certainly not everyone in the world has access to medicine by any stretch of the imagination. And in fact, for the human woman, the life expectancy was much lower than this, uh, back about 100 to 150 years ago. I don't know exactly when the C-section started uh, to be practiced uh, widely, but before the C-section, most women died in their last childbirth, which was in their 40s or 50s. <laughs> okay, yeah. And so with uh, the C-section, and also with women having fewer children or no children, then the life expectancy I think it's the one medical procedure that has uh, contributed the most <laughs> to increase the life expectancy of women, uh, at least in the Northwestern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And I think also the discovery of um, penicillin. Yes, penicillin also, but that would be a, for the population as a whole, right? For men and women, right? Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I should say this because this is, I use it as a guidepost uh, when I'm asked an issue at the end of life, should we let go or not, uh, you know, how much uh, medical, um, I don't want to say make medical aggression, but medical treatment should be offered, uh, should be done, or are we actually <laughs> going into futile care again? For the end of life, we have to go patient by patient, patient by patient. And the age will just by itself can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> with regards to the end of life and the declaration of death and so forth, we always focus on the management of uh, the pain. And again, I've talked about this as kind of a roundup of topics I've talked about before the distinction between pain and suffering, which I made already, but we're focusing on managing the pain and or the suffering, whether it's physiological or psychological, uh, and we're looking for relief of that. We're not seeking to 
uh, relieve the patient of their life, but of their, of their pain or suffering. Mm -hmm. So we do this benefit, benef benefit burden analysis, but this benefit burden analysis is always patient centered, right? We have to be careful here that the benefit burden analysis is not done for the caretaker or the institution or the practitioner, but for the patient. In other words, is this an excessive burden to the patient or not? Mm -hmm. Or what is the benefit relatively, I mean, a significant benefit or relatively little benefit for the intervention? This obviously is pointing to the prognosis, right? What is the prognosis, which I think I already covered also. Diagnosis is the current state of the patient. Very important because without a diagnosis, there is not a prognosis. There is no treatment protocol to be applied. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the diagnosis is crucial, and that's why the MD is crucial, because it is the, the MD who diagnoses. And then according to that diagnosis, what is the current state of the patient? What does the patient have, either physically or mentally, right? Then according to that diagnosis, we'll follow a prognosis and the hope of recovery. From excellent to extremely poor, right? A full range. And then that will determine the degree of medical intervention to be done on the patient or therapy or nothing, nothing at all. Okay, so um, leading into these two terms or two sets of terms that don't necessarily have uh, compatibility in the bioethical realm or in the clinical realm or the medical realm. Okay. So bioethically, we talk about ordinary or extraordinary means of life support, ordinary or extraordinary means of life support. You also see the words proportionate or disproportionate means of life support. Again, think of the benefit burden analysis. If it's excessively burdensome, then that treatment or a life support is extraordinary or disproportionate, right? Excessively burdensome. But clinically, the doctors and the nurses and the medical setting is not going to talk too much about ordinary or extraordinary. These are bioethical terms and these are ethical and theological terms, if you will. They're going to talk about standard care or experimental treatments. So they correlate more or less, but not exactly, not always. All right? And here's where, as bioethicists, we need to try to bridge the language, bridge the language between the doctor and the patient and or the family of the patient, because most patients and their family don't have the medical language or the medical concepts very clear. Okay. And I can tell you from experience, the hardest case is when the patient or the, or the family think they know medicine. <laughs> they think they know medicine. And then it's harder to, because we have to undo some preconceived notions and take them to the proper understanding, right? So that's where bioethicists are uh, crucial in trying to bridge the two uh, language. Some families are like a wall, but they have them to And even that is a condition, right? It's called denial. <laughs> It's right. I, mean, I, have, I, have, yeah. I had, um, I don't know whether she's still there or not, but I have a hundred year old lady what? with dementia yeah. who was living in an MCP, mm -hmm. fell, broke her pelvis, mm -hmm. and um, she came to rehab. Right. But in this rehab setting in the hospital, the rehab program is very intensive. It's mm -hmm. three hours of therapy a day. Wow. So she was very encephalopathic at the beginning, and then she couldn't do well with the program. Mm -hmm. So finally, her mind cleared up, and she started to eat better and mm -hmm. with hydration, and she 
was able to perform. Mm. And she done beautifully, but the Buddha was not satisfied. Oh, wow. So, you know, we were going to distract her because she was already walking and now this to go around the ALA, and the Buddha wasn't satisfied with that. And mm -hmm. he made her a distract date. She appealed to Medicare. And I don't know which hands, you know, in which hands it fell, right. but Medicare approved her to stay longer. Oh, boy. And then all the therapists are telling me, I feel so bad because we so, are torturing this lady. Right. The so, daughter comes to therapy, and when we let the lady rest, it's like, look at us, it's like, why are you letting her rest? You know? Wow. Let her keep working. Oh, my goodness. I want yes. to see her to dance. I know. So, <laughs> exactly. So everybody <laughs> says that they felt so cool. cool. But the daughter, mm -hmm. she wanted her mother to do more and more and more. Right, right. Yes. A hundred years. A hundred years. That, yeah. It's that you see it all the time, and I don't know honestly if it's ignorance or what it is. My family did that to my grandmother. She had a not a full fracture, but it's what's that called? Yeah, hairline. Hairline fracture in her pelvis, so mm -hmm. from a fall. Mm -hmm. And the therapist signed a letter saying it's not healed. Mm -hmm. It was in the first two weeks after this happened. And they were trying to force her to walk up the stairs. Like she could oh, find, she could oh, have any oh, Wow. It's like documented proof. <laughs> you yeah. have an x ray with yeah. a fracture. Yeah. She could okay, she could walk up the stairs. Like, I, yeah, yeah. I had to like fight, fight yeah. for them to like carry her with a wheelchair up to the flight. Right. They were right. trying to drag her out of yeah. her wheelchair to pull up. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because, right. because it was yeah. in our imagination. Yeah, plus that movement of the stair is extra, right? One thing is walk on right. plane. Well, that was level plane. Yeah. yeah, that was actually heavy though. Also, huh? <laughs> that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that was like just the thing. They were like, whatever, that was easy. Like, she could not go up any steps because right. of the fracture. Yeah, sometimes it's more difficult dealing with, with family than dealing with the patient himself or herself, right? It's, it's very challenging. Yeah. 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 They don't consider the whole person, right? Yes. It's, it's, I can't um, imagine. Yes. I feel like we're cool. And right, that right. we're doing excessive. It's right. Excessive. Yes, it is. For me, it is. It's too much. It is excessive in that particular condition. So, again, looking at this particular patient, you know, what do you expect? A 100 year old soul? She's not going to run the marathon, please. <laughs> And that's all she needs to return home. Right. Oh no, but I want to see it that it consistently she wasn't using anything to walk before, but now she needs exactly. to walk because she has fractures, she had a lot of pain. Exactly. But um, right. they want yeah. her to be like she was before. Before or even better than before. Right. Long term. And I think with the other ladies, even longer, right? Because of the calcination and everything else. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's very difficult dealing with the with family at times when they come in with all kinds of preconceived notions and they already come kind of defensive against the system because it has been, and again, news is sensational, right? And the reports when there is a nursing home or a rehab center that is negligent and they get cider or something like that, then they spoil the reputation for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so people now get into this antagonistic mode, which I just hate. And they start from the get go. They start in a in an antagonistic, uh, defensive posture instead of trying to work together for the good of the patient, right? And listen to the medical profession. Who knows best? Really, they do know best. <laughs> they didn't spend those years <laughs> learning for nothing. Okay. But uh, it is challenging, it's very challenging. So again, I make a little plug for the passport care team in those cases when the institution has them, that's where they pay for their salary. 
is when they are able to bridge that antagonism between the family and the institution, because sometimes they can, they can do that, you know, coming at it from a more spiritual or sentimental way. Uh, but these are definite challenges that are there today. I don't think they're getting any better necessarily because also the way the practice of medicine is evolving in the U.S. and becoming more and more institutional, right? That, that the doctors are, are now belonging to systems and they have to do so many patients per hour and so forth. So I see that the personal aspect of the doctor-patient relationship is compromised. Mm -hmm. And so there's not that much time to spend with the individual patient or their family, even worse, to explain in detail what's happening and what is the best prognosis, what is the best course to take here for this particular individual. It's also, it's, you know, you said you mentioned the hospital care, but mm -hmm. the hospital care is not involved um, in every aspect because it's only palliative that you have to have a chaplain participate in. Yeah. Uh, hospice requires there to be a chaplain, not like a requirement. But when you are selecting hospice, you're already open. Like the most I do is teaching is working. Yes. And, and, and the pain yeah. and the meds and stuff right. like that. But really, like, like what, what she has to deal with in the rehab, that's right. a much more intense situation where education and like, the ERD would be really beneficial. Right. And unfortunately, yeah. that's not in that setting. It's not in the rehab setting, it's not. And necessarily, right. I don't think it's in nursing homes either because they just coordinate with the local parish to get right. support. Um, Which is a very touch and go yeah. thing. A lot depends on the parish itself, and whether it's they not can like, supply or not. I mean, we do have, so I think Baptist does a pretty good job of, of having a lot of chaplains, but at Doctor's Hospital, where I got my training, yeah. it was a lot less. Yeah. And I was the only, I was a Catholic intern. The yeah. only one. Really? So I they That's an intern. Send me, like I was an intern basically. Right. But, like, yeah. but they would tell me to go to see the Catholic patient that had been there for over a week. Right. And I, I already had my certification in the ERD, so I would mm -hmm. do a lot of that. Very nice. And I was the only person right. that had that education in that group. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was gonna say you're right. And uh, in our local situation in Dave County that I'm most familiar with, Baptist, when it was a standalone, right, there on Kendall, uh always has integrated their pastoral care team to their practice of medicine from way back. In fact, I think that the origin of Baptist was precisely that, from what I heard. It was a group of Baptist ministers together with Baptist doctors that founded the hospital originally. And so it's very integral to their mission, but other, other institutions, other healthcare does not they don't have it really, unless it's like palliative care or, or right. hospice, right? Because that's really the end of life. But uh, yeah, it's, so it's very challenging, really. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of uh, pressure on the doctor and the nurses to try to explain things. And that case, I was so upset. Yeah. Medicare, we had a lot of patients that, yes. let's say I have a, a six-year-old with a stroke right. that needs to stay longer. They yeah. feel it, they will not. Wow. And then this 100 year old lady with dementia that yes. is already, you know, punched off to go to the ALF, which she was. Right. And then they approved the wow. ALF. Yeah. So yeah. it's it is very, very yes, yes, it is. You see the inconsistency yeah, there, exactly. and it's yeah. beyond you because that's at the federal level. It was, it was Medicare, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see that bridging this uh, conversation here between ordinary and extraordinary and standard or experimental treatment is an important one, okay? I'm going to focus now precisely on the ERDs since it has been brought up several times and this is in the section of the end of life, that part five of the ERDs, remember how we reference them with just the directive number. So two directives specifically that, oops, I think I made a mistake on this one, not. This is supposed to be 57, I got it wrong. Give me a minute, <laughs> I have to correct this one. ERD 57, this 58 is for nutrition and hydration. <laughs> Ooh, let me go through for a moment. Open folders.
Uh, 57, yes, yes. So 56 is on ordinary means of life support, and 57 is on extraordinary means, extraordinary means of life support. Yeah. It's very clear. And then 58 is specifically to nutrition and hydration, but that's uh, uh, like I'm mentioning for the next uh, lecture. So let me pull it out of here. Yeah. This one. Yes, this one. There we go. Okay, so here the 56 then, a person has a moral obligation to use ordinary or proportionate means of preserving his or her life. Proportionate means are those that in the judgment of the patient offer a reasonable hope of benefit and do not entail an excessive burden or impose excessive expense on the family or the community. All right, so the excessive burden can also be interpreted as excessive expense. This is more in a setting where the patient may not have insurance, health insurance, or the health insurance is uh, a Mickey Mouse thing that has huge deductibles or only covers certain rare conditions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So you can see that it uses a language, ordinary or proportionate means, right? And these obligate. This is what we would normally call standard care, but not always. 57 then is the opposite or the converse of this. A person may forego extraordinary or disproportionate means of preserving life. Disproportionate means are those that in the patient's judgment do not offer a reasonable hope of benefit or entail an excessive burden or impose excessive expense on the family or the community. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward, the distinction at least in principle, in theory, between ordinary and extraordinary. And then the challenge is applying this to specific cases. Right? Specific cases. All right, uh, what we can do now, because uh, we're just gonna go on some specific cases, looking at three main vital organs, the kidneys, the heart, and the, and the lungs. So if you want, we can take a little break now and come back and uh, finish it off. Probably take another hour or less. Is that okay? Okay, so we're gonna take a little break. I'm gonna pause. And we'll come back in about uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay, Monica. Okay. Yes. Sure. The durable, sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll bring it in uh, at the end. Uh, but also uh, during the break, so I started the recording already. And let me turn the lights here. But doctor, you brought up another interesting scenario during the break, which is on beginning of life issues and preserving eggs for the future when there is uh, radiation therapy or something like that. And I would like to pick that up also, if you don't mind, briefly, because thinking that perhaps I did not cover gift as one of the techniques that is available in, um, in beginning of life uh, fertilization, all right? which is uh, gamete, intrafallopian, uh, intrafallopian, uh, intrafallopian tea uh, treatment, right? 
uh, aim of, the, the acronym is GIFT, and I'm going to talk about that briefly at the end. Okay. All right. Uh, let's uh, continue here on the ordinary and extraordinary means and try to look some applications just uh, briefly. Mm -hmm. So, again, to recall the distinction between assisting or substituting vital organs. Uh, so, I'm just paraphrasing or rephrasing the same basic principle in different words, using different words. Ordinary or extraordinary means of life support assisting or substituting vital organs, right? Uh, we know that mm, when there is no more cure for the patient, care always obligates, but uh, we'll deal a little bit more with that in detail when we talk about nutrition and hydration. Uh, today, I continue to focus on ordinary and extraordinary means of life support. So there is the obligation to assist by the organs, but no obligation to substitute them. Again, within the context of end of life, a person who may be dying, their organs are shutting down. So one may substitute the vital organs, but it doesn't obligate morally ethically. So the question comes when to withhold or withdraw life-saving treatment or life-sustaining treatment. It can either be withhold, which means not to provide the treatment, the life sustainment treatment, or to withdraw the treatment once the treatment has been established, when to stop. For example, I hear that in the Jewish tradition, many times they will never start, they will withhold, because once they start a life sustaining treatment, they may not withdraw it. They're kind of stuck with it, all right? Uh, that's what I heard. It may not be in all Jewish traditions. We know there are several different um, nuances or interpretations, okay? Uh, but that's different from us. Within the Christian tradition, yes, we may withdraw the life sustainment treatment if the condition of the patient has changed, has worsened, typically. Okay. And then we went withdraw. But something that had been started before, like, for example, either dialysis or vent or, or the issue with the CPR. So those are the three cases that we're going to look at now and revisit, because we've looked at them uh, briefly before. So <clears throat> once again, within the context of ordinary and extraordinary means of life support, right, and how to distinguish knowing that ordinary means obligate, but extraordinary means don't obligate. The first vital organ that we're gonna look at is the kidney, and the kidneys in pairs. Functionally, we have to see them as pairs, because we know that a person can live, in fact, with one kidney, right? So functionally, when, the, when a person goes into renal failure, either both kidneys intact or a solitary kidney, all right, renal failure, the standard practice is dialysis, and that's standard of care, which generally should correlate to ordinary means of life support. And it, it would, but we have to say it depends. Clinically, we understand that it's standard care <coughs> because the protocol has been worked out and has been validated statistically that it works, that the vast majority of uh, patients of renal failure uh, are, are able to tolerate and in fact uh, flourish with, uh, with the kidney machine with dialysis, okay? However, again, we have to go patient by patient. For this particular patient in his or her situation, overall situation, would dialysis be ordinary? or extraordinary means of life support, okay? So in the judgment of the patient, that makes it very subjective. In the judgment of this patient here and now, would this be an excessive burden or not? So is the burden excessive or is the burden tolerable? Because it's gonna be a burden. Just the driving there, for example, and then staying in that setting, typically three to four hours, 
one day on, one day off. As far as I know, that's still the protocol, even if the machine has become smaller and, and more sophisticated, okay, more efficient, but typically one day off, one day on, you know, week after week after week after months, either they get the transplant if they're on the list or they don't, there are 100,000 people on that list in the United States alone, so it may be years before they do get the transplant, who knows? In the meantime, the clock is only moving forward, so this person is getting older and older, all right? And the machine in the, in the long run, dialysis, can also be debilitating to the person, okay? debilitating. So there may come a point after years, uh, perhaps, and they're still kind of low on the list, or they don't want a transplant for whatever reason, or they may not qualify because they have some other comorbidity or some other illness going on or condition. They may not qualify. They may have a rare blood type or who knows uh, that they cannot find a match. For whatever reason, after years, a patient may decide that this is becoming an excessive burden now. It used to be a tolerable burden when I was younger, but now it's becoming excessive. And I'm basically living for this treatment, I'm living for the dialysis, instead of the dialysis living for me, right? Okay, so at that point, even though clinically it's still standard care, for this particular patient, it has become an excessive burden. And therefore the patient may say, no more, no longer, I'm out, what's gonna happen? They're gonna die of renal failure. Physiologically, if you follow that scenario, what's gonna to happen to that person? Intoxicate. They're gonna to intoxicate to death. The kidneys are gonna fully shut down. No more urine output. There's no more cure because the cure, there's actually no cure. The care was dialysis. So now it has to go into comfort care, right? And so you see that, uh, <clears throat> It's delicate, but it's real, and we have to respect that. We can try to convince the person if we think that the person is being unreasonable about their judgment. But if it's making sense, we need to support this patient and allow them really to die because the death process has begun. In fact, it started a long time ago with the renal failure. <laughs> but it was bearable before, and now it has become unbearable because that renal failure has accelerated. The rest of the body is not responding as before. And so that death process is becoming more and more active. And the hope is that it will go faster also in the end. You know, and they don't linger that much, but it's gonna happen. To talk with the family is very important at that point because they may not understand the subtle thing about renal failure being a, a terminal illness. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, but, uh, with specifically, we can use the Foley for that because when you start looking at that urine output and it starts getting uh, darker, brown, and less and less and less, you can just say to the people, look, this is not normal. You know from your own urine, this is not normal. These kidneys are failing, all right? And what is not coming down is being retained, which is intoxicating the person. So let's go into comfort care here. Mm -hmm. Question yep. When you're doing your transplant patients, they don't uh, transplant the adrenal glands. How do they get? Yeah, the whole yeah because the adrenal gland is integral to the to the kidney, right? They're sitting on top of the kidney, so it's a whole thing. Yeah. As far as I know, yeah, they don't leave the adrenal glands behind. Am I wrong? Yeah, I think they take them. I honestly, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I never thought about it ever. Yeah. No, I think <laughs> I it's. Asked for, so, Professor from Yale, yeah. she told me that they don't transplant the adrenal gland. Really? And I was like, oh, um, that's interesting. I thought that was a kind of silly question. Oh. Because she told me they did. Wow. And um, I was wondering hmm. how do they get their, is it cortisol that they excrete? Right. right, yeah. And how do they get their hormones and stuff like that? Hmm. They don't have them. Maybe they need the adrenal gland and they just remove it. They can't itself? I, mean, I thought they, they were, they well, I know they sit on top. They need them. And they do the transplant, they remove the they remove the kidney itself. They leave the, the adrenals. They leave the adrenal glands, oh, huh? So they no, I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking. Hmm, that's it. 
I don't know. I never thought about it, really. Never and about uh, it. so, okay, let's let's look it up and see uh, what we come up with. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I should know because I donated one, right? <laughs> I should know if they took it or not. <laughs> well, at least I have the other one. <laughs> Just in case, <laughs> I still have some adrenaline in me. <laughs> yes. All right, so uh, yeah, let's look it up because I really don't know. Maybe that's why you're saying. Yeah, it could be. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're not Yeah, kind of a, a drastic way of losing weight. <laughs> Donate a kidney and lose some weight. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Look at this. It worked for me. All right. So we can see there with dialysis. I always use that one because I think there is such a, a good example of what could be still standard medical practice, and yet it may at some point become subjective. Uh, I mean, extraordinary means of life support for this particular patient. So just pointing out the subjective element in it, all right? Okay, the other one then is with the lungs, the vent. Before that, just uh, recalling or reminding all of us the difference between the respirator and the ventilator. It's a little counterintuitive, right? Because the respirator is assisting the lungs with oxygen to the nose and or the mouth, right? But it's still external, it's just assisting, it's providing extra oxygen, but it's at the external level, mm -hmm. either with a little cannula or with a mask, a loose mask, or even a tight fit mask covering nose and mouth, but it's still external, you see? So it's assisting, this is not ventilating, <coughs> In my mind, anyway, the, the terms are counterintuitive. They're kind of backwards. So I would think that this is ventilating. <laughs> the respirator is actually ventilating. And the ventilator is actually breathing for the patient, is respiring for the patient. So for me, the two terms are kind of backwards, but that's my non-clinical <laughs> estimation of the term, right? I always have to think respirator is the one that assists. And the vent is the one that actually substitutes. Mm -hmm. So the ventilator, depending on the setting, but that is the uh, machine that goes, the tube goes right into the lungs, into the trachea, through the mouth, through the uh, throat, into the trachea, into the lungs, and is hooked up to a computer system and a uh, what is that called, a diaphragm here, an artificial diaphragm, a, um, mm, bilge or something like that. Anyway, there's kind of a, an air pump, a day, an air piston here that moves up and down to compress the air into the lungs directly. Okay, again, this may be kind of an outdated machine, but basically, is computerized and it controls the settings. And that's why I say it depends on the percentage of air, of oxygen that is being pumped in. If it's at 100%, it means that it's doing the bulk of the breathing, substituting the lungs, literally substituting the lungs because of the air pressure. It's forcing that oxygen to go <coughs> me, through the alveoli into the circulatory system and the lungs at that point are passive. Mm -hmm. May I ask yep. that also in that scenario, mm -hmm. if the, the patient can be ventilator dependent, meaning that he's right. not initiating any breath, he's only breathing whatever the machine gives them, right? Yes. So it's not exactly. only the, the amount of oxygen provided, right. is that respiration um, initiated or not by the patient. Right. Yes, exactly. And that's why I think there is a, this uh, protocol is the winning protocol to wean the person off the machine. And I think they initiate that as soon as they hook up the patient to, to the vent. So let's say they initiate the patient at 100%, right? And right away, within hours or maybe minutes, I'm not sure exactly, but they start diminishing the pressure 
on the vent to try to wean the patient off, precisely because of the dependency. And the body gets lazy and gets used to, you know, if I'm being fed, I'm not going to make the effort <laughs> to feed myself. Right? Also because, remember, the, the lungs are innervated both uh, with the voluntary and the involuntary nervous system. So we have two modes of breathing functionally, physiologically, the lungs have to expand in order to inhale, right? They have to expand. It's like a balloon. And so there are two modes of expanding the lungs physiologically. Uh, voluntarily, when we go, we inhale and exhale voluntarily, but what are we doing? Our chest goes up when we inhale, right? Because we're moving the ribs up. Mm -hmm. We move the ribs up and there are little muscles that connect from rib to rib, all right? There are skeletal muscles because there are muscles connected to bones and muscles connected to bones are skeletal muscles, means that they are innervated by the voluntary nervous system over which we have um, will, <laughs> voluntary. I can move those so I can tell my ribs move up and relax down, all right? Those little muscles are called intercostals, I think, or intracostal? Yeah. Intercostals, all right, those little muscles. But they're voluntary muscles. They're, they're part of the skeletal uh, muscular system, and I can move them voluntarily. Do, functionally, what that does is that that raises the chest and that opens the lungs. But then at night, when I'm not thinking about that consciously, there's another muscle that can also expand the lungs, all right? And that's from below, and that is the diaphragm, precisely, which is a smooth muscle, not connected to bone, so it's innervated by the involuntary nervous system, all right, over which we don't have voluntary control. And that diaphragm is like a dome. When it's relaxed, the dome is high. And when that smooth muscle contracts, it comes down. It kind of flattens. By flattening down, it pulls the lungs down and it expands the lung. Huh? And that diaphragm is between the thorax and the abdomen. So above the abdomen are the lungs. And below the abdomen is uh, our stomach and intestines, the digestive tract, all right? The soft tissue. And the diaphragm is uh, involuntary. That's the one that's hooked up to the uh, medulla to the um, brain stem, and that's involuntary. And that also happens, okay, uh, when we sleep, for example. So it's a question of expanding and relaxing uh, the, uh, and contracting the lungs. And because all that takes effort, the body prefers not to do it if it's being done by a machine. So that's the dependency there. Um, I have a question about that. What about, I have patients who have anxiety and when we do spiritual procedures like relaxation, relaxation, mm -hmm. they no longer have issues breathing. And I've seen it with my patients as well, like where you know yes. all of a sudden they have to have a nurse later on because they can't breathe and yeah. they do the relax they relax and then they're fine yeah. without it. So what is that what's going on? Yeah. Okay. As far as I know, functionally, again, from a non-clinical perspective, I think it has to do with the CO2 buildup, actually. That we go into shallow breathing, all right? And it's, it's kind of a feedback mechanism. Don't know exactly how it works, but I know it has to do with accumulation of CO2, that it accumulates too fast and we're not getting rid of enough CO2. And so it's shallow breathing that uh, precipitates faster breathing but it also accumulates more CO2. And I think that the end game of that scenario is that we collapse, we go unconscious when there's too much CO2. And then what happens is the involuntary nervous system takes over and makes us breathe normally. But now we are, you know, we passed out. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's, get, it's getting the, the person to relax so that the CO2 can actually be released from the body and we get, the proportion, we get more proportion of O2 than the accumulation of CO2. Is more or less, is that the idea or? Well, I think that when you're doing this fast shallow breathing, you right. are not accumulating enough CO2. And that's oh, so it's why, backwards. Yeah, okay. And that's why precisely somebody who sees that is high enough 
Yes, right. Oh, so, so they, they accumulate more CO2. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. So the CO2 <laughs> is actually the gas that is stimulates the brain to breathe. To breathe. Mm -hmm. Like for example, when somebody has acute apnea, mm -hmm. those like yes. snore, they, they stop breathing. Right, they stop breathing. And this raised to a certain level, uh -huh. so they, they start breathing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so it's backwards. It's not enough CO2. Not enough CO2. With shallow breathing, fast shallow breathing, we're getting rid of too much CO2. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah, I knew about the bag, but now I understand. The, the person actually has to get a threshold to trigger the deeper breathing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and definitely psychosomatic, right? Psychosomatic because we have the innervation of both the voluntary and the involuntary system controlling breathing. So the vent, again, as far as I understand, two, three weeks is really too long, all right? And then at that point, they're going to ask the question, are we going to keep the patient long term? Then we have to do a tracheotomy because uh, their throat can no longer tolerate the tube more than two weeks. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. What's, I, I, what's I the... myself, they were starting to, um, my father-in-law pushed yeah. like, start mentioning it at the end, and it was very easy. Mm -hmm. And then they were starting to start mentioning it at the end of the first week. Oh, yeah? Um, going into mm -hmm. two and I was in the state of Florida that yes, it technically was two to three weeks. It has been for many years, but they that they are some hospitals are pushing it at one week, mm -hmm. and uh, most don't want to go past two weeks. So it's rare to see two weeks now. Right. Yeah. The only way I was able to pull up two weeks in three days was because I said I was there and I said you know I want to have to go commit before you even think about putting a trigger on my body. Right. So that at least gains a little bit of time. <laughs> Twenty four to forty eight hours. I think. Just that same day, I gave enough time for a miracle. He woke up, asked for the rosary, uh -huh. pointed to his rosary, and from there we had three days where then he was paying his meds, and we were able to educate. Wow, look at that. It, it was. And, and he picked up on and his own. Were, yeah, mm -hmm. two years in his bed. They were mm -hmm. pushing it already, and she had. At one week. Wow. I wonder what's. I'm just thinking out loud what could be the trigger for that. It could be, well, that in general, they're trying to get people out of the hospital as soon as possible to begin yeah. with because of the super bugs and all that. I think that in, in that case, what they do is they do um, trials right. for the mm -hmm. patient to see if they can breathe on, the, breathe, uh, breathe on their own. Because right. And when they fail multiple trials that the patient is not initiated breathing or breathing enough to sustain without the land assistance, right. That's when they probably the prognosis is in place and they said, okay, we need to take this patient. Right. Yeah, they didn't do that. Right. Uh, so I think that okay. the prognosis was poor in that case. Yeah, they had poor prognosis. They also, they, they really thought it was going to die. So one of the things that like, um, I've been told with the hospitals is that one of the things that hospitals do, because they do get a lot of money, is intubate crazy food. Uh, right, yeah, because then that's long term. Yeah. Yeah, it's lower maintenance and more billing. Well, I have to tell wow. you that it's really more functional power. Mm. Because if you, if you cannot keep an energy food either oh, too no, long, you can't. Right. So it's right. safer to have a peg mm -hmm. to yes. provide adequate nutrition. Right. You know? Yeah, it is, and actually, they clinically. Do anything, they can hydrate this way also. Yes. But in this case, it mm. was like a death sentence. Because really? he was and he's diabetic mm. and he made it because of his condition. Mm. You would have not survived the surgery mm. itself. You think what for the peg? Because the peg is minor surgery. The peg is a minor surgery. Yeah. It's the trach maybe. Minor. Well, my dad has been told us she had fifty percent chance of dying. Oh, oh really? Oh, wow. That was five years. How, That's five years. years? That's a very non-invasive. Yeah. Surgery. I've heard it's minor. Just oh really? Yeah, Check. Not on the surgery. That's from because the peg itself. The knee, they can oh. never heal oh. properly. Oh. They didn't take into consideration instead of going pocket with all yeah. around. It close really? Properly. So maybe yeah, they were. Very it's uh, it's so rare, rare, huh? Yeah, yeah. imagine that's my experience. I was like, right. with my anemic, so with my father and I embedded in the 
yeah. um, terrifying. Yeah. In my years yeah. of experience, and I don't like yeah. to believe it too by now, mm -hmm. which is not <laughs> 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 I, have, uh, I have not seen many complications with it. No, I have a lot of my muscle species we haven't had. Yeah, normally, it's normally. It's a very... I don't know what happened, but it kind of got stuck. In the muscle, but it's because oh, really? it was a very painful process. And what could be there? Herniated, maybe? What was it? Herniated? Did we come here? Fibrosis. I think that's what it was. Oh. And so they, well, he wanted really? help because he was, uh, he was able to speak. Yes. But that was the only other complication I've ever heard other than my grandmother. But mm. I was like diabetic and even <laughs> forget about it. You know, yeah, you thought it was the I risk. Was, like, very right. Thanks for regard. It did work, huh? Collaboration with uh, divine intervention there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, so again, this is another scenario where it could be at some point the standard of care, which is intubation, <clears throat> may become extraordinary depending on the particular patient, uh, his or her condition. Okay, so this is. Again, another example, especially at that two week, let's say average of two week um, interval where the decision has to be made to do a trach and go more long term or not. And then we'll look at the particular case that is so delicate, which is uh, uh, PBS persistent vegetative state or just vegetative state. And that one will look in the context of nutrition and hydration, I keep mentioning this, which will be the next uh, lecture on this, right? At what point under PVS does the vent uh, become a, uh, an extraordinary means of life support? All right, I think this one is kind of redundant, just the when it does go long term, people can even live with a tracheotomy uh, indefinite uh, time. So it's not a life threatening condition per se, the tracheotomy. All right, the third example is with the heart and CPR, whether to resuscitate or not. Again, uh, the answer is going to be well, it depends. For this particular patient, is the CPR assisting? In principle, is substituting the heart because the heart has stopped naturally. Okay. And so, does the CPR constitute ordinary or extraordinary means? Is the standard care when when one calls nine one one and the meds come? That team, by by training and by law, is going to uh, resuscitate unless there is a DNR order or someone makes a strong case, the next of kin or the one who is uh, in charge of the collapsed person, they said they didn't want this. <laughs> how does, because uh, I'm not clear, how does the, um, the rescue team react to that, the paramedics, when the spouse says do not resuscitate? Let's say, of course, it's, if there's a DNR in place, then they can show that, but there's no DNR. It's just the word of the spouse. I think it depends on the condition part. Yes. I mean, because if you have, let's say, like, a, you know, an eye something, right. an old person, and the spouse right. says, please do not resuscitate. Right. Don't honor that. They, may, they honor that, but if it's a 50 something year old, right. the wife is saying, do not resuscitate, I don't think they will. They won't. Do. So it's, uh, at the end of the day. Or the patient has major illnesses, yeah, you know, and, right. and the spouse, and even in that 15-year-old person, right. you know, let's say, had a comorbidities, already, you know, right, or it's a dialysis patient. Mm -hmm. Exactly, say, you know, yeah, do not, right, okay, and they have said they didn't want to, they express that. But I think that in general, what I've seen is that unless they have a paper, they will do they it. They will do it, yeah, so the paramedics pretty much, they can, it's their call, basically, right, the first responder is their call. Whether they do or not, yeah. right? There's legal exposure also. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I've had actually, unfortunately, patients without a DNR, and I ended up having to have a DNR, and I had 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 to have
did not provide the, the DNR the time that they arrived. Or really? Everything was oh, really? Yeah. Problematic. Yeah. And they had a DNR in place, but they it was had not. They had a DNR in place, but I was very upset about it. Wow. Um, so I, I mean, because how do you know otherwise, right? Like, if you said it, if you just say it, how do you really know? Yeah. Yeah. Unless it's, I, where, where I have seen it like that is if you have been it's at the hospital for a mm -hmm. while and uh -huh. they know that you don't want to sign the DNR, then you do yeah. have the option of the primary caregiver to say the autopsy is called. Um, to say at the time, no. Mm -hmm. Because that's because they already know you more and they know the situation. Because that's what they did for my grandmother. And they mm -hmm. were like, uh, just say no and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But at the home, I, I could like, do isolation and mm -hmm. it would have to be a protection. Yeah. There, I don't see how they could possibly yeah. Right. Not. Yeah, because typically in the hospital setting now for admission, they even present uh, the option of DNR and so forth. So. But uh, at the home situation. Oh, like in an emergency. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think they have. No, in emergency, I think they, they do it. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine if it the wife says, no, do not resuscitate, and then. Yeah. Like, but I think that. <laughs> right. They right. Have to sure, but I'm thinking that first responders go like the fire department. Do they really get sued? I don't know if they may be protected by law from from lawsuits, at least uh, civil or something like that. Again, just thinking out loud. Uh, but it'll be interesting to find out because I mean we hear of uh, hospitals and rehab centers and the medical profession getting sued all the time. But I never hear about the fire department getting sued, for example, or first rescuers, uh, that way, paramedics. So they may have some legal protection there precisely because they're first responders. You know? So they have a lot of discretion as to, they've been trained to, to determine the situation and, and make a, uh, a split second decision on what's best for this particular individual. So it could be that there are some, yeah. I'd be interested to know if they're some kind of somehow protected from lawsuits. Then that gives them more freedom really to act, right? So they're not yeah. acting with... Ask around, yeah. Okay, so we have two questions pending. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, so CPR, but also the uh, AED could also be considered, the fibrillators could be considered extraordinary, even though they could be standard of care. I mean, we have one across the hallway here. <laughs> There's an AED machine uh, there on the wall. Uh, I don't know if I would be able to use it in case of emergency, I'm kind of scared, but even a uh, defibrillator could be considered extraordinary depending on the particular situation of the person. And if they had a DNR, this could be considered within that purview, okay. All right, so the bottom line here is to be as clear as possible between killing or allowing to die. Whereas killing is never acceptable practically, but allowing to die is not only acceptable, but it's actually uh, the right thing because when the, die, when the death process has begun, even if it's subtle, then we need to switch into comfort care, right? and continue to focus on alleviating the symptoms, the pain or suffering of the person. And that is allowing to die in peace as much as possible. Which again, I think I mentioned it last time already that uh, it's estimated that 60 to 70% of Americans are already dying in institutions no longer at home, which you think that ideally at home is the best setting, right? But uh, it's happening less and less, more institutionalized uh, death. So that's at the social level, the concern has its own complexity, right? All right, that's what I have for now. Any questions or comments from what we've covered here? Let's go to the top. Uh, you said that the EEG is done Normally, that's what I've heard. Yeah, but again, as a non clinician, that's what I've heard, but I don't know if that applies in every case. What do you think? 
just I haven't been in the, involved much in that setting anymore. And so you know I in brain death. I did it yeah. when I was younger, but right. to see if you know they do the EEG and they didn't have to repeat it. I think it was a neurologist who came also to, to yes. determine that to determine and certify. Yeah. Based right. on the responses on the reflexes and and okay. the All right. And so another question would be, in the determination of death, does the clinician have to state what criterion she's using or he's using? They have, they have I to. I think the neurologists have certain parameters yes. to declare somebody brain death. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but they have to state that it's brain death yeah. and not uh, cessation not, of. Not for now. Not. Death. But they have okay. to say. Based on the parameters that they have, right? The neurological okay. Examination. Okay. So you that need all these criteria to somebody. Okay. And so it, it is brain dead as opposed dead to. Yeah, it is what you said. They cannot be dead because yeah. it's not. It's not until you test today and arrive. That's what happens. Okay. Okay. So the neurologist is mean, certifies that the patient is brain dead. Right. Yes. yes. But yes. it's not the declaration of it. Exactly. Ah, interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's where the second after opinion. After that, they, right. they usually decide to disconnect the ventilator. Ah, uh, yes. Right. Okay. And then, and then after. What, then okay. what the, the body is going to do. I see. Or how long it's going to take. Ah, I see. Okay. Oh, it's, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so that makes sense clinically. The neurologist declares the patient brain dead, and then they're allowed to extubate because, in principle, now they have a cadaver. Exactly. And there's no. It's well, not, they have a body. They have a body. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. That's why I say cadaver because it makes a distinction between a person and a body and just a body, right? In other words, uh, yeah. Okay. So they have a body, mm, and because the person is brain dead, now they can extubate, mm -hmm. right? Because it's futile care. And then who the attending? It does uh, yeah, the declaration of it. Then when they unblock the patient, yes. then the patient slowly starts to yeah. you know, stop breathing and then the exactly. heart you know, right. and stops. I see. Okay. So ultimately, it is a sequence. Uh, yeah. It ends up with no heartbeat and no breath, uh, regardless. <laughs> yeah. Does the attending have to be present? If you remember that somebody who has some brain functions, mm -hmm. they will be they will have still the breathing that the part in the lung will be. So they exactly. will continue. Exactly. It would be like an efficient. That's right. Phase. So that brain death uh, declaration of uh, brain death uh, could have been uh, wrong if the patient continues to to breathe, for example, well, after exacerbation. Exactly. Then it wasn't really technically it wasn't brain death because. By brain death is understood, total brain death, but it's just that uh, the neurologist uh, gave the wrong diagnosis. <laughs> and the neurologist no. that we just met at the hospital, my family actually didn't want to, I don't think he wanted to do brain death. He specifically said, I don't want to use really? the word, yeah. You see? And he said, mm. he, I think he even did partial. Oh, really? Yeah, he said partial. Mm. Okay. There, 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 there was still, was there was still some, like, some, he didn't show the action, but it was a major symptom. Well, so we, we decided to do the excavation. But there was an EEG going on? Yes. Oh, okay. So in it that was, case, it was, it was assisted. Was, it was, yeah. Okay. Exactly, yeah. Right. And it was going on in the background, and then they finally decided right. it was within hours. So, like, yeah, if there was no, um, it wasn't functioning enough to sustain life. But he it was said, just I didn't know that you were bringing that up because he specifically did not. And he even said it like, back to my. My grandma said, "Is he brain dead?" Uh -huh. But I think she was waiting for that. Right. She said, "Validate her." Just right. Validate. And he was like, "I won't. Be, I don't want to use those terms." Uh huh. Look at that. Okay. Yeah. So he wasn't really... 100% sure. Right. Otherwise, he would have done it. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So when in doubt, you know, abstain just in case. Exactly. And <laughs> again, the, there's no getting away from the lawsuit in the back of his mind <laughs> that he doesn't want to be. Sued out of his practice. Because I believe, I mean, because like my mm. memory is still trying to come mm -hmm. back. Yeah. When I was doing internal medicine, right. that uh, in the ICU, that part of the test is for brain death declaration. Yes. That they 
some events later to pour right. for a few minutes to right. see if the patient can breathe on their own. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. it makes sense. So invariably, even with the brain death declaration, it's going to come down to no heartbeat and no, and no breathing. No, exactly. yeah, it does. It has to. Functionally, you know, physiologically, it has to come down to that. Yeah, because we can't sustain the breathing of the heart, but not the brain problem. That's exactly right, right? Mm -hmm. And because it's the breathing and the heart that sustain the brain, and when those stop, then the brain is going to die because of lack of oxygen and so forth. Okay, so we've covered all this. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. because I have another, I see a lot of patients who have like bone marrow failure, mm, and they don't have enough blood. Oh, okay. So there are these for a patient that I will call is um, blood transfusion dependent. Yeah. I have a patient that wow. every uh -huh. three weeks he goes to the hospital really? to get blood transfusion. Wow. His hemoglobin goes down to 5.6. Goes to the hospital, yeah. you get a chance to come back, and right. another three weeks, he goes to the hospital. It's just the bone marrow, is there no actual cancer? No, it doesn't no. have any cancer, it's just the bone marrow failure. Well, how oh, they say more like they call it myeloproliferative disorders. Oh, <laughs> myeloproliferative, you know, what we're talking about myeloproliferative disorder, oh, or if they're home sometimes they have fibrosis, they die uh, and by doing that biopsy uh, of the bone marrow. Uh, but these yes. people are transfusion dependent. So yes. Yes. that one is a vital organ, blood, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the patient we are sustaining life because right. he is we're providing for a Right, right. So that patient has the right to say, I could be that at yeah. some point that becomes an that. excessive burden. You see, that's the subjective but element. I mean, it's big. We can do that. Because this patient, I'm telling you, I've known you for at least three years now. Yeah. Well, in three years, yeah. every three weeks, he goes for different things and yeah. comes back. Yeah. Well, at least I'm just thinking out loud here that it's stable. It's every three weeks. It hasn't become every two weeks or every week. So at least there it's still linear. Well, in this when case, that there starts, are some cases that yeah. when you progress, they don't, the blood doesn't last. Is, yeah. Exactly. Then it's definitely becoming excessive burden, right? You can see there, there is a trend, there's an upward trend. So that one may be a little more clear. This one is kind of stable as long as it can tolerate every three weeks. And we know that blood transfusions are becoming difficult because there are not of enough yeah. donors and so forth. And they're getting very creative about substituting that, but still, it's what it is. Any idea if it's congenital or? No, it's, uh, it happens later in life. Yeah, I see it with I age. See it very frequently. With age. Yes, you do see it, huh? Yeah. Wow. A lot of patients have they have a marrow insufficiency. Yes. And how do you how do you diagnose it? A biopsy or bone marrow, bone marrow biopsy? An actual biopsy, yeah. 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 So I presume does his immune system become compromised because of the white blood cells or no, really, because no. it's, usually, it's just RBCs. Some people have it like for all three components, like right. other diseases. Right. And that one is like the worst scenario. Uh-huh. But some other is just like the red blood cells. Only RBC. This patient is only red blood cells, wow. so he only gets Well, that's pointing to some kind of a genetic thing that uh, that is specific to the even with age that shows up later in life, but it's specific to the RBCs. That's very interesting. See the pathway of, of production. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but truly, well, yes. But that blood. patient would have the right. Yeah, right? because blood is a vital organ. <laughs> is it really uh, brain cell transfusion? Like, what is it an in and out thing, or do you have to stay in the hospital? No, it has to go and then it just stays like overnight. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So it is an overnight. It's not just a patient. Yeah. I wonder why it's overnight for a transfusion. Yeah. It's substituting the heat and it's substituting the blood. So it's a vital organ. True, true. No, yeah. From that, from the biological perspective, yes. I think that to me, it's clear that he can refuse at some point. But functionally, why is he kept overnight? Because that complicates the yeah. thing, right? If it was just outpatient, in contrast to outpatient. Yeah, outpatient right? I know, but it could be that they're just waiting for the hemoglobin to go up, right? Because he's anemic. He's going in at five, well, five point. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Y
like, exactly. They want to see that uh, that hemoglobin went up. Yeah, because they don't want to release him anemic. Again, that may be exposure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be that he needs a second transfusion. Yeah, but it can be years. Yeah. And then he has to be here, so he cannot make decisions. Oh, really? Oh, so that complicates. So he only has like a nephew, I think, that is the one who So has he written the living will? No, And I believe there is not even a living will. Really? Wow. I think it's... 80s. 80s already, yeah. Well, you see, he's around, he's hovering around that age. That's what yeah, I'm saying. He's living for life. The <laughs> With the nephew. But then they accuse you that you're killing him. You know? Right, right. It is. Yeah. It's very delicate. He, perhaps if you can Especially find out. The doctor, if it's the doctor, right. because it's like you said, you already have this negative outlook. You know, you yes. know, you know like, I guess yes. there's two sometimes. Exactly. Like, well, Honestly, I'm focusing on the pain. In this phase, the two parties in here, and mm. have that decision. Mm. In the other, on the other hand, on mm. the patient that I had had with this condition, mm. with our chronically impact, yeah. right, then it gets to the point that they say, I don't want anymore. You see, right? you see that? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Or do you see even that they're alert or is it able to live their life? Yeah, they're exactly. Like, you really certainly have a good life otherwise. Yeah. They have to have right. to be checking every week. They have to check. Mm -hmm. They have to check the blood. Well, they have to go to the hematologist. Mm -hmm. They have to go. To the yeah, there is a burden. There is a burden there. Is yeah. the burden tolerable or excessive? Maybe I don't know if they have a faith tradition. If they're Catholic or Christian, that may be one way to approach it. But it is delicate, and certainly the doctor doesn't want to be accused of trying to kill their patient, right? <laughs> so perfect for it. Right. Michael, right. You know? Yeah. 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 Nature is going to take its course at some point. Mm. And he's healthy otherwise. Yes. Look at that. Amazing. Yeah. Can fall in broken bones. He heals. Oh, really? Amazing. Yeah. Wow. wow. It's incredible. Guys. Yeah. Well, you know that at some point something's going to give, right? Something is going to start failing and then everything starts collapsing at some point. But for now, yeah. Okay. All right, what I wanted to do, if there are no other questions about this, this topic in particular, ordinary, extraordinary means of life support, to be clear from the bioethical perspective, all right? Uh, what obligates is ordinary, extraordinary does not obligate, may be done, but it, a person in conscience can decide to refuse and then be allowed to die in peace. Now, that closes this uh, lecture, but I wanted to talk a little bit about gift because of a question that came up in the break. And you don't have to give me a summary in this one, but I'm gonna leave it recorded anyway, because I'm thinking that I did not cover it in, um, in the beginning of life uh, course. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pause and restart just to make a distinction here in the recording, all right? Let me just pause for a moment. So this uh, section of the recording is going to have to do with a technique that may be ethical at the beginning of human life, and it's called Gabit Intrafallopian Tube Transfer, or GIFT for short, the acronym. I can make this a little bigger. All right. Gift. So let's look at gift for a little bit. I'm just speaking from the web here. Gamete intrafallopian transfer or gamete intrafallopian tube transfer. We can take the words one by one, because they're very informative. Gamete is talking about what? Yes. Egg and sperm, one. egg and sperm, all right? So the sex cells, the ones that transmit the inheritance from one generation to the next. This is applied to the human, but the technique uh, can be used in many mammal, really. Intrafallopian, so it's a transfer, right? It's a transfer of gametes 
into the fallopian tube. All right. How does that work functionally? Well, we have to obtain gametes first, <laughs> the egg and the sperm, and then they are transferred into the fallopian tube before fertilization. That's the key here, before fertilization. Let me see if there are any images here we can look at. I'm just exploring the web with you. Uh, for example, maybe this one. Okay. Now let's transfer in the embryo. Maybe this one will work. We'll make it a little bigger. Well, it's a little pixelated, but the idea is this. The egg and the sperm are transferred into the fallopian tube, basically into the ampullary area, where fertilization takes place normally. So it qualifies as in vivo, you see, because it's taking place live within the woman's reproductive tract where fertilization takes place normally, naturally but it's being assisted to the hilt. This is a maximum assistant. And even the diagram here is not quite accurate because the cannula will have the egg in the sequence, will have the egg, then will typically have a little air bubble and then the sperm. And when that little mixture is released into the ampulla, the egg is released, the air bubble is released, and the sperm is released. The idea is that the air bubble will get out of the way and the sperm will fertilize the egg. <laughs> That's the theory behind it, okay? So, but it should be packaged that way so that the fertilization doesn't actually happen within the cannula, but actually happens within the ampulla. Can you put only one egg? Only one egg, yes because you don't want two eggs being fertilized, you know, that's twins. So just one. And the chances? Well, how, the egg has to be extracted previously. So what I don't know for gift, if they use hyperovulation or not. They may just go after, just wait for her cycle and go after the ruptured uh, follicle or the follicle is about to rupture and capture that, that egg, so that's one, or they actually put her through hyperovulation with clomid or something, and she'll have several eggs maturing. Again, thinking out loud, when would this be done? One possible scenario would be for uh, cancer treatment that is not reproductive cancer, but involves radiation, whereby the eggs could be damaged from the radiation, right? Okay. Yes. So gift chemo also because of chemicals. It can also be teratogens, right? To the, yes. Yes. Right. So it comes out right. So all right. So third things have to be in place. Exactly. We look at on the what conditions would gift be proper. And I say this, I'm just giving you a little background, because remember the, the official Vatican document that condemned um, in vitro fertilization was Donum Vitae, Donum Vitae from 1987, all right? And it came out of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith under then Cardinal Ratzinger, who then became uh, Benedict XVI, Pope Benedict. Uh, that was Donum Vitae in 1987. Let's go a little further back for a moment. And I know I'm going kind of backwards here, but I'm going to go back to the foundation and then build up from there, okay? What is the foundation? The foundation is Louise Brown. Remember Louise Brown, the first tested baby that was born successfully, right? So that was the first successful in vitro baby, meaning that there were any number of trials done before that, that 
were not successful and therefore never made it to press. <laughs> okay, but in 1979, Louise Brown was born in the UK from the doctors, Steptoe and Edwards, who later got the Nobel Prize for it in medicine. So obviously this at the social level was a tremendous success, uh, even though in my opinion and the opinion of the church, a horrible injustice that was introduced into society, this in vitro thing. All right, so 1975, the first in vitro baby is born, proving that the technique works at least until birth. She grew up 20, 30 years later, she herself had babies. So that proves the principle that she was fertile, all right, and that she could, and her offspring, they had to wait another, I don't know how many years for those children to have children and to prove that her offsprings were also fertile. So that's the full proof of the principle there, it took two generations really. At any rate, in the meantime, in vitro fertilization moved forward, galloping rate to the point that it's a multi-billion dollar industry today. It's still boutique because few people can afford, frankly, 20, 30, $40,000 for every attempt implantation. But in vitro goes to the core of it because the fertilization happens in the lab as opposed to the woman's body, which would be in vivo naturally where it's supposed to happen in the ampulla, right? And what I'm saying to you, just to recall the analysis of in vitro, the bioethical analysis is that the core of why in vitro fertilization is bioethically wrong is because it violates the natural place where fertilization should take, should occur, which is the ampulla. You see with gift, it does not violate that principle because with gift, the egg and the sperm are released into the ampulla. <clears throat> Whether that fertilization happens or not, it's up to those two gametes, all right? If fertilization does happen, then that fertilization needs to continue, that, and that uh, embryonic development needs to continue five to seven days, continuing to grow and develop until the blastocyst would eventually implant in the endometrium, you know, five to seven days later and continue the natural process of pregnancy, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, when in vitro came up in the horizon, in the medical horizon in the early 80s, some doctors were looking at, some fertility doctors were looking at how to be creative about in vitro and see if some of the in vitro process could be rescued and used ethically for their uh, clients or their um, patients who were infertile, or infertile couples. And some of these doctors, I forget their name, but they came up with this uh, gift, all right? So you notice that technically it's not really in vitro. It's not in vitro, but it does procure the eggs beforehand, and it does procure the sperm beforehand. So to procure those egg and sperm, the same ethical principles have to be in place. You know, it's risky to the mother, the mother has to accept, or the wife has to accept, the, the risk of procuring her eggs, right? Uh, first, the very first one is that it has to be a validly married couple to begin with, things that we assume. So it, not, it should not be for single people, it should not be for homosexual couples, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it should be a married couple because that child has a natural right to be conceived and to be raised with both parents intact and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's say we have a couple who is validly married. They don't have to be Catholic or sacramentally married, but they need to be validly married. For example, a Jewish couple. It's not sacramental because they're not baptized, but they are validly married, meaning that they don't have previous marriages, there are no impediments, and their marriage is valid in the eyes of God. Therefore, their intimacy is also valid in the eyes of God. Okay, so they're validly married, the eggs are obtained beforehand, and one possible um, reason for doing GIFT is precisely uh, uh, cancer treatment on the wife. So the eggs are procured beforehand, all right? The sperm should be procured within the act of intercourse with her husband, 
with a perforated condom and so forth, just like we spoke before. Then that uh, sperm is sent to the lab for washing and, and manipulating. And then the little sandwich, if you will, is assembled in the cannula, which has to be sterile and all that. So it's a sophisticated technique whereby you have, so in the cannula you have to insert, uh, I guess, if it's going bad, I don't know if they do it from the inside or the outside of the cannula, really. But um, anyway, it has to be that sequence, right? That there is the egg at the tip of the cannula, then there's an air bubble to prevent the fertilization outside of the amphibia. Mm -hmm. The air bubble in between, and then the sperm. That is inserted into the ampulla, released, and then hope for the best, right? So in anticipation since now, and since GIFT, GIFT was developed in the 60s, I'm sorry, in the 80s. And I know this because when Donum Vitae uh, was published in 87, seven years later or eight years after uh, IVF was invented, right? Dono Vitae is silent with regards to gift. It neither condemns it nor, nor affirms it. So if the Catholic Church has not pronounced herself against the technique, it can go either way. You have theologians who can justify it and theologians who will not justify it. And you can take either opinion as valid. You see? You can take either opinion. So you can see that there is a lot of manipulation, but the very core is preserved, which is fertilization in vivo, in the ampere. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I was thinking that only the egg could be placed in the ampere. Yes. And just yes. have it there and then have normal intercourse. Normal intercourse for the couple. Yes, yes. absolutely. Use. That is assuming that the husband is competent and all that, clinically okay. potent and all that. Yes, that could be too. Functionally, one has to understand that uh, <clears throat> how the timing, again, is, is uh, crucial, right? But what I wanted to say is, uh, you're right, that, and that could be also ethical, so it's and it's less manipulative. Less manipulation. It yeah. is less manipulation, because what I see, in my personal opinion, I would be inclined to say no to give, even though I understand that the fertilization is self in vivo, but I'm concerned about the sperm not getting there naturally right. because it's bypassing natural selection. So it's not necessarily the strongest sperm. You see the most competent sperm. Exactly. And that's why, by chance. exactly. That it's never gonna be the same. A technician in the lab cannot select the strongest sperm at the biochemical level because the tools are just not there, all right? But nature does do that. Nature does that in that race, if you will, of the sperm getting to the egg. So it's bypassing natural selection. And even though I haven't read about an argument like this from the Catholic perspective, that's simply my argument <laughs> as a biologist. I think that we all have a natural right to selection. Because on average, it will make us the healthiest individual. Just on average. I suppose that the probability of fertilization is higher than sperm. Maybe that's it could be, mm -hmm. but it depends. I think a lot depends truly mm -hmm. on the competency of the of the sperm oh, of the husband. Because you know, if they're stronger, the one's going to get there. You know, they're all that's competing, right. You know, going up there. Absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, there has to be a difference mm -hmm. between putting the sperm naturally and doing yep. this. I suppose there has to be. Well, there are many differences, but. Focusing like on biological speaking, not biological. right, right, right. There has to be a reason why they do. Yes, maybe it's, it's like hundred percent for sure. There's going to be fertilization this way. Maybe right. the other way is to. Okay, so but here. Agree, 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 Andrina. But here, the chronology makes a difference, and the history makes a difference. In other words, gift came up on the horizon in the '80s precisely because some doctors with, uh, maybe they were Catholic, maybe not, but they had scruples with regards to, or they had apprehension with regards to in vitro. Okay. But they were thinking an alternative that could be ethical, all right, but still focusing on their patients who are infertile for whatever reason. Now on the male side, a typical infertility is incompetence of the sperm. 
which this would bypass the incompetence. All right, so you're getting actually sperm of uh, poor quality to still get to fertilize, mm -hmm. which that's where I think that one could make an argument is not fair, okay? Because now we're using sperm that is of less quality and that quality could even be done at the genetic level. And so that's going to translate into a baby that is not the healthiest that he or she would have been. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, of course, but in the case mm -hmm. of the male, mm -hmm. it is impossible for a person that is not perfect to do it naturally. I mean, not necessarily. Because well, you know, okay. If you sperm, you're yeah. so yes. If for the men, it's almost impossible to do it. Okay, and correct. Because you're right. Always, I mean, the only way that's going to be natural is with natural... Correct, with intercourse and allowing the semen to be totally competent and all that. Agree, with 100 million and, and so forth. However, this is where the distinction between assisting or substituting becomes crucial. Granted that we're not substituting fertilization here, we're assisting it, but then when we look into assisting now, we see a range of assistance, from the minimal to the maximum. Okay, and I'll give you two extremes. Uh, the maximum, as far as I'm concerned, is this, is a gift. Procuring the egg and the sperm, all right? Less assistance would be only the egg and natural intercourse, allowing the sperm to get. Even less assistance would be, for example, one of the mm, relatively common reasons for male incompetence is tight shorts, tight uh, briefs, tight underwear because it brings this, the, the scrotum up against the body and it's too much heat and it kills the sperm, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Sperm are very, that's the reason, if you think about it functionally, why would the testicles hang out of the body which have greater exposure to damage and everything else? It doesn't make sense physiologically in contrast to the ovaries, for example, which are very much inside the female body because they're protected there, right? And that's across the board with, with mammals. Why would the testicles, which are so delicate that they carry the inheritance of the next generation, be literally hanging out the body? It doesn't make biological sense that way, okay? And it's because sperm, precisely because it has a little cytoplasm, is very sensitive to temperature. And the higher temperature actually causes mutations in the DNA. And that's why they literally hang out. Even more so, it makes a difference if it's summer or winter, if it's hot or cold, and if it's, and if it's if it's uh, cold, the scrotum kind of um, gets tighter and pushes the, 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 the testicles up closer to the body to get a little more warmth. And when it's hot in the middle of the summer, the testicles tend to hang down low to get away from the heat of the body. And so it's a natural always, physiological thing. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, in babies. They're not fertile. They're not fertile, exactly, because it's too much heat inside the body, right? Okay. Yes, yeah. really, I mean, yeah. it, <laughs> right, right, right. We call it elegance, right? Nature is so yeah. elegant that way. It's amazing, it's amazing. It's a different way of elegance, <laughs> but it's because it works very well, okay? Uh, but so by manipulating the sperm, we're bypassing all that. However, what I'm trying to point by all this is that assistance, granted that we're assisting, therefore it may be justifiable, but there are ranges of assistance from minimal assistance to maximum assistance. So we cannot get away from this particular couple, this particular patient, what is their particular situation? What is the source of the infertility, okay? Now in the case of cancer treatment, is not really infertility as such because the reproductive tract, assuming, is intact. And what has happened is that in the past 30 or 40 years, since the beginning of in vitro, See, at first there was no, for, there was no uh, freezing eggs. Sperm could be frozen for decades now, sperm uh, can be crowd preserved, precisely because of the low cytoplasm it has, and therefore the relatively low amount of uh, water content, right? So it doesn't crystallize. But eggs, because they have so much cytoplasm, it was much more difficult to freeze them without bursting them mm -hmm. and, and <coughs> killing the egg. So it's only more recently, in the past few years, that the technique has been developed for freezing eggs. So now that is available. But that became available much later than the actual gift technique was proposed. You see, so this is a further development. 
So now, what I'm trying to say by all this is that GIFT, which what had been put aside as a cumbersome technique because it was much faster and easier and better results to do it IVF, even though unethical, right? Now there could be a resurrection of GIFT because of the possibility of freezing eggs before the cancer treatment and then retrieving them even years later for fertility, okay? So it could be a resurrection, if you will, of GIFT ethically because of the possibility of freezing eggs, doing the treatment, and then restoring fertility to the woman. But it still takes some manipulation. And uh, we can think of possible scenarios, but uh, what I wanted to leave established is that it could be considered assisting, not substituting, precisely because the very core of the issue is that the fertilization itself is taking place in vivo. All right, the actual thing about fertilization, the union, the fusion of, of gametes, of egg and sperm, all right, the syngamy, if you will, is going to take place in the embryo. Now, whatever it takes to get there, it depends. We have to have a number of things in place, right? Valid marriage uh, within the act of intercourse or following, that's another one, following that act of intercourse and not a subsequent, because when I start a second act of intercourse with my spouse, the, the gametes that were released or procured from that first intercourse belong to that first intercourse, belong to that first unit of dimension. Mm -hmm. And so the process has to be clocked, if you will, and timed properly so that the couple is an extension of their intercourse and not, you know, after a second or subsequent uh, acts of intimacy. Mm -hmm. Right? So it gets very technical. <laughs> But if it involves the possibility of this couple, at the end of the day, having their child, well, no, it can be justified, all right? It may be justified. Okay, so what else about gift? Yeah, there was another one, then it's like everything in life, right? Uh, one thing up, comes up the horizon and then you get variations on the theme. <laughs> and the variation of the theme of gift was zift. Mm -hmm. And so whereas gift is acceptable, zift is not acceptable. And zift comes from not gamete transfer, but zygote transfer. Yes, weird, think about it. Zift, right? Zift, the Z instead of the G, so the G is for gamete, right? What is being transferred into the tube, into the fallopian tube, is the gametes in gift. In zift, what is being transferred is a zygote. Ah, so where did the fertilization take place? In vitro. Okay, and therefore, no, no, Nanette. Uh, close, but no cigar. <laughs> exactly, because you see, it's technical and people say, well, who cares? There is a treatment for infertility and there is a website, you know, and they all package it as the same. You want to do one or the other? We're here to please the customer. Mm -hmm. But you see, there is a fundamental. They call it to alternative uh, to in vitro fertility. Exactly. For people who have qualms about in vitro, right. this you one is acceptable. That. So you see the manipulation, but that's your very good bioethicist because you pick up on, that's exactly, that's, yeah. <laughs> Literally the devil is in the detail, is it not? Okay, so this is the industry just providing another alternative for people who don't want it to. We understand you have moral reservations about IVF, not to worry, here is the ethical one. <laughs> and it's either gift or zipped, and by the way, on Zift, we probably can give you a better chance because we already manufactured the zygote. And you don't have to depend on the bubble getting yeah, out of the way. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And by the way, exactly. Well, okay. So even just last week, what's the other saying? Not a week goes by, right, with our new biological issue coming up. I think I saw it last week. 
grandmother giving birth, giving birth to her grandchild. Yes. 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 Was married from her daughter, exactly. confirmed from her son who was gay, who was married and wanted to have a child, and she she she, she was um, a surrogate, right? She was a surrogate. I don't mean so, the surrogate woman. Brothers, sister, yes, but isn't that illegal? That right. that causes uh, genetic issues. It's still not illegal. That's what uh, I understood. My father, I think, was the sisters, the, the daughters. I don't, I don't remember the egg. That's a good question. What was the origin of the egg? Who was the egg donor? Because I remember, yes. So, the son, there's a lady. She's in her fifties, I believe. In her sixties. Sixties. Wow. Well, and then she yes, gave she her baby to her son. Right. So, okay. So this is this is how I uh, read it. This lady is having a conversation with her son who is gay and married to another man and they're talking about he wants to have children they want to have children him and him and his husband want to have children all right and uh and the mother i think flippantly just said well i can just carry your child or maybe the son was the one who says you can carry my child or something like that <laughs> I says, yeah, I can carry your child. So they were having this kind of flipping conversation. And then the, the gay couple started thinking more and more about it. And at some point said, let's do it. Because you, one of the two husbands can provide the sperm and then we procure an egg from the clinic, which, and we undergo in vitro and your mom is the surrogate mother, right? The surrogate womb. And so they went ahead. And did it, and nine months later, this grandmother is having, giving birth to her, and I think it's a daughter, I'm not sure if it's, you know, it was a daughter, so. Exactly, who's? My mom, it's my father, it's my aunt, and my grandmother, that's where I see the that that would be incest illegal and right. in the United States. Well, maybe not. Often. I think there was like one day, but it's not illegal. But um, I don't know if it applies to in vitro though. That's yeah, a good question. Same concept, genetically, absolutely. Exists, but oh yeah. Exists, but oh. It hasn't been physically There's no intercourse, right? Yeah. But I don't think we care about. That's the funniest thing about it. Imagine all the ironies in this. So this child has. Two fathers, right? Has uh, a mother who is also her grandmother at the same time, and then has another biological mother, and he doesn't have who is also, the, his, aunt. Who is also his aunt, if it's the sister of the father, <laughs> <laughs> of one of the two fathers. Bizarre, bizarre, totally bizarre. Or it could be the sister of the other, right? So that bypasses the the other injustice of uh, of risking uh, abnormalities on the on this job. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the, that's the actual photo. Is uh, the grandmother slash mother uh, holding the? Uh, it was I think it was in the BBC. Uh, let's see if we find this. Uh, so what do we put, uh, grandmother? Yeah, the grandmother gives birth to her own grandchild, 61 year old woman. Gives birth. Oh, is that not there? Nebraska. Uh, it's my grandchild. To her own granddaughter. Yep. In the same of it. Like it. Yep. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. There is the photo. I mean, in the yeah. choice, don't you see the Maybe. picture? It's like, oh. My exactly. My mom. Everybody's exhilarated, extremely happy, because of course. Yeah, they're, 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 they're not a need for a mother. Okay. 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 So let's go one let's go one at a time. Exactly. All right. So the grandmother slash mother is sixty one years old. One question. She's probably not ovulating anymore, so it was her eggs. Uh, and uh, menopause, obviously one can still carry a baby, one can still um, gestate uh, being menopausic, right? <laughs> Which is interesting. 
Well, maybe she was still ovulating. I don't know. It doesn't say if she was menopausal or not. But uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, does it say the source oh, yes. of I think the egg? Was the, the, in this couple of days, yes. he donated the sperm and the sister of the husband. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh. The, 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 no, the, the egg. The okay. The egg. okay. Okay. So then. Right. So, okay. So the yes, child has. Right, there you go. Okay, so the child has um, two fathers and has um, a grandmother who is also her gestation mother, and her biological mother is also her aunt. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And in all of this, with all those many people involved, there was no intercourse, right? No. <laughs> there was no intercourse. So talk about manufacturing a human being. Manufacturing a human being. Why? Because they want it. Just because they want it. And so that's where we're at. And the child is going to ask questions in the future. Exactly. But Why you know, not? exactly. It works, they're not. They are going to think this is normal. So they, they either hide it, but now it's in the no, press, yeah, it's all over. Yeah, How can they hide it? Right? Yes. It's, it's going to depend on how this human being is, you know, developed. Sure. You know, because if you yeah. develop in a culture where all these things are normal, you know, you may not have a, an issue with it. Yes. Okay. So it happens that the child in question is a female, it's a woman, it's a granddaughter, it's a girl. It's a girl. Exactly. So how she's going to be raised by two fathers. And so who the, the female model for her, who this girl naturally deserves to have a, a mother, right? Who is maybe 20 to 30 years older than her and so forth. But the gestational mother is in her 60s. So who's nurturing? Maybe she's not getting being breastfed or who knows who's breastfeeding her maybe they take turns between the grandmother no. and the aunt oh. mm. oh. yeah but you know what's close to us is pushing the envelope right because the whole idea here is that excuse me please your model of family is your model medieval model of family it doesn't fly anymore we're in the 21st century and this is what science can do for us so who are you to get in the way? Please step aside because it can be done. If it can be done, it will be done. And here's the proof. When you right. make kids when they are adopted, mm. they grow and usually they have a need to find out who is their biological father or not. Right. So this kid is going to want to know eventually who is my biological mother. Right. So my prediction. Oh, it's your aunt. It's your grandma. Yeah. Probably well, gets. Guys out instead of the guy asking the girl. Right. From right. what I hear, nowadays oh, yeah. it's like yeah. the roles are. I would be yeah. happy with that. Yeah. If the girls are asking guys yeah. out and not other girls out. Exactly. <laughs> sure. Here, I'd be happy with that. The way they would make it mm -hmm. is, is out of love. Exactly. The oh, mother, sure. The grandmother did it out of love. How compassionate, son. how altruistic, right. how good. Really? I love that girl. Yeah. You're going to have a Sure. That's right. Bring it on. Exactly. But and so it is. 
you never you, ne you didn't pick it up huh okay well there it is exactly now we think about it a little bit um it is said that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior right we tend to continue to act the same way we've been acting so i'll probably get sued at some point and who cares because my prediction for this girl is that she will be raised up in this kind of environment with two fathers and uh, two quasi mothers <laughs> who is one who is contemporary with her fathers who is also the aunt and the other one who's the previous generation was also her uh, grandmother biologically but gestationally mother so this kid is going to grow up confused perhaps but otherwise clear that a family is anything that we want it to be right. a family is anything that i call a family and a marriage is anything that i call a marriage because to boot if these two men are legally married by the state and recognized by the supreme court then again who are you to tell me that these are not my parents I just happen to have two fathers instead of a father and a mother. And by the way, I also have two mothers. <laughs> and one is also my aunt and the other one is also my grandma. So who cares? I have actually more than you do. I have more family than you have. Because you only have one father and one mother. Mm -hmm. And it's a yeah. great to, to carry like a lot of things like, oh, mom, I don't want to lose my baby. It's kind of my baby. It's great. Yeah, He's well, not to start doing that. oh, no, it's and been done already. Know, um, yeah, you know who's doing that? Yeah, the, yeah, actresses, actresses are doing that. Yeah. The entertainment industry and the athletic yeah. industry, because if I'm an athlete, I don't have to take time off for gestation. Someone else mm -hmm. can gestate and I can keep going. And as an actor or actress, the same, right? And so I wouldn't doubt that this girl, when she grows, uh, she may be hormonally suppressed until she can decide if she okay. wants to be a she or a he, you know. And again, the sex, we never discuss the sex because she's definitely X, XX genetically and she's not going to change every chromosome in her body, every, every sex chromosome. But the gender is different. Excuse me, the gender is culturally imposed. And why should I be imposed a gender that I don't want to be? So maybe I want to be like my dad's my two fathers, and I want to be a man too. And I'll just transgender. First the hormonal therapy, then the top surgery, and then the bottom surgery, and I'm ready to go. Yeah. And because in vitro is available for me, I can have any number of children that I want, etc., etc. And then another possibility, well, we don't want her to grow up alone. We want to have a second child. And so maybe this time they flip and they get, so let's see, genetically, she has, she has exactly and then they flip and then uh, maybe the siblings uh, fall in love and they can also marry because why not you know they have different genetic material and so on and so forth so you can think really they, they just destroy the concept of family the concept of uh, husband and wife and they're saying these are alternative families and that's when we get into a language that is value neutral which is a grave injustice because people in society say, oh yes, oh well, why not? Look at that, oh my goodness, that's so caring, that is so caring. We're not gonna be judgmental. They really love each other, why not, right? Why not, why not? Why not? Because it's totally utilitarian. No one has ever thought one iota about this granddaughter, about this, girl that has just been brought into this world no one has said that absolutely and so we're manipulating life and to me this is human trafficking this is contemporary enslavement totally legal and money rules right i can certainly pay for it so why not and that's the utilitarian mentality that's the alternative ethics to doing principal ethics it's just if it works do it the end justifies the means whatever means i can get there as long as it's not illegal and if you think it's so wrong 
will make it illegal. And then we're never going to break the law. So, and can you imagine, Father, if, the, if this couple split? The right. Of oh, no, it's right. nice for them, but it was. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? That's right. That the exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. So now four people have claims on him, right? But what happens in 10 years if they want to split and they have right. a minor? Who's going to take the minor? Right. Because four. You have to follow the that does happen. Yep. That's right. It does happen. Yep. And the court decides. It may end up being. Yep. So this, this minor may end up with a fifth uh, parent who is a state. <laughs> So the two fathers don't get her, the two mothers don't get her, the state has to now become yes. another custody of the and state. Can say what mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah of course. And she's like she's not in the she's not in the marriage, cycle. right? She she's enough. She exactly, genetically. <laughs> Fifty percent of her genes. Well, unless they have a very good attorney draft a contract. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. But, yeah, so you see it becomes, a, and, and what we have is then we have law defining yeah. ethics yeah. instead of ethics defining law. This is, this, these are the things that this is very indicative of our contemporary society. And yet, because we live in a democratic society that the consensus is the one that builds the norm and so forth, uh, it, it really is very challenging. That's why I think that Bioethics is truly a very relevant career. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't really want to take it seriously because uh, they want the alternative, which is just if it can be done, technology. See, think of the underpinning. Why is this possible? 10, 20 years ago, it was not possible. In a, in a very real sense, it's possible because of in vitro at the technological level. It's also possible sociologically because of the legalization of, of uh, gay marriage. Okay. So you have the confluence of all these uh, horrible things with the end result that real life children are gonna suffer, are gonna suffer. Uh, see, I hate to end like this. <laughs> <laughs> go back to the power of attorney. Oh yes, thank you. I just wanted right. to clarify. Durable. The durable versus just the regular POA. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna close this discourse, just leaving it on this note, and hopefully at some point our society will regain some sanity. In the meantime, we wanna go, I just wanna pull up the, uh, the draft here for a moment. Here's one from Florida, it's the actual document. Okay, so durable, you know, that power of attorney is a very powerful document, right? Because it delegates authority to uh, another person, a proxy or agent. These words are interchangeable. Proxy, surrogate, or agent, in the case of law, many times they use agent. But the thing about the durable is that it precisely kicks in when the person becomes incompetent. Only when the patient is incompetent. Yes, that that's is correct. Enforced. That is the durable, yes, it becomes enforced. And that's what makes it distinct from a regular POA, which is while the, while the person is actually conscious and competent, it's just delegating someone else, it could be a different country or something like that, a representative, all right? Uh, or it could be actually be an attorney when I delegate my authority to, to an, uh, an attorney to represent me. But the durable one is uh, number 10 here, has to do with healthcare. And it's when the patient becomes incompetent that the durable part of attorney, that's what it means. It, it durates, it, uh, it, it persists through the incompetence of the, uh, of the patient.
Should be the first part. Four percent. There we go. If I am incapable of making healthcare decisions or providing informed consent. That is specifically the issue of durable. At least from healthcare perspective, I really don't know with regards to the other issues, fiscal uh, and so forth, right? But as far as healthcare, precisely when the patient becomes incompetent. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. So uh, let's see, just to review briefly, we have. Uh, we're on the 13th, so next week, Holy Saturday, no class. The one after that, yes, April 7. Uh, I'm sorry, April 27. And that will be April 27, will be the last class for the end of life course. And then we'll start the environmental course on May 4th. Yes? Okay. Very good. All right, so I want to wish all of you a blessed uh, Holy Week and happy Easter season. We'll meet right after that. Okay, really, you're welcome. Thank you very much. I'm going to shut down now the recording.